In yet another rare show of continuity, Voyager's listening to a signal that sounds like an Imperial probe droid being broadcast through that communications array we saw in the last episode. If you recall, we used a network of relays owned by an alien race that were less than pleased to transmit the Doctor to a ship in the Alpha Quadrant. While there, he had some shenanigans with another holographic Doctor, played by Andy Dick, who I've since discovered is a complete and utter bastard, by the way, before making contact with Starfleet. When he returned, it was with the news that people back home now know Voyager is still flying, and will do what they can to help. Which is why we're flying towards some space fog while listening to a garbled message. Jacote assumes it's Starfleet Command trying to contact them through the network, apparently not wondering why they're using a standard transmission instead of a holographic one like the dog must have mentioned to them. Tuvok urges caution as, based on the short amount of time passed, Starfleet are unlikely to have thought of a solution yet. Kim clears up the signal and plays it again. It is indeed from Starfleet Command, but that's about as far as it gets. After mentioning that there's something of vital importance for Voyager to know, the signal cuts off. The rest of it is being held in one of the relay stations, according to Kim, and Janeway wants to pop over and collect it. It's Chicote who reminds us that the people who owned these relays were less than welcoming, and that was before we electrocuted one of the buggers. Janeway's got the scent now, though, and won't stop till she has that message, and if those aliens, the Herogen, are a problem, well, we'll deal with that when we come to it. That might come sooner rather than later, as an imposingly angular ship is listening to the same message. We're shown a selection of skulls to let you know these people are proper dangerous and shit. I'd point out that chitin mandibles and bone skulls aren't seen together on Earth as they're from two separate branches of evolution, but this is alien stuff, so maybe on their planet a chimp fucked a crab or something. The Herogen in charge asks an underling where the transmission they're listening to is coming from, and is told it's from far, far away. They can tell where it's going, though, and they set a course for the relay station Voyager is heading to. Herogen in charge starts applying war paint, and making them uniquely identifiable suggests they're going to be an important part of the episode, so let's bring out the Wheel of Names! For those who don't know, the Wheel has random names suggested by patrons, and when we come across a minor character in an episode, we'll sometimes let RNGesus decide what to call them. Herogen in charge's new name is... Union John, suggested by Lieutenant Arazil. Suitably named, they set course for the relay and the inevitable ding-dong with Voyager. The crew were still busy theorising about how Starfleet is going to get them home. Janeway tries to temper their expectations, but even she's delighted by the prospect of being in contact with the Federation. Down in Astrometrics, the Doc is making a house call, as Seven hasn't reported for a check-up. She's too busy trying to retrieve the garbled message, claiming that its importance warrants her being awake for nearly three days straight with no regeneration. She's managed to get six more words out of it, but doesn't tell us what they are, so I'm going to assume they're come to quarks. Quarks is fun. The doc's advice that she should stop is ignored, so the universe itself intercedes and forces the issue by making the ship vibrate. Janeway wants to know what's going on, and Kim tells her it's our old friend Gravimetric Disturbance. He says it's coming from the relay, which is still some two light years away, so it must be a very serious wibbly. He compensates for it anyway, and the ship stops shaking. As he does, Tuvok notices that the ship narrows, and it looks proper messed up. Everything's broken, and the only person aboard is dead. It's also a little bit on fire. Janeway orders us closer so we can teleport the corpse aboard while she goes down to sick bay to look for herself. It seems the label dead was quite the understatement. Our new guest doesn't have any bones, flesh, or internal organs. All that's left is an alien-shaped morph suit. The doc says it was a deliberate surgical procedure, but can't put an accurate time on when it happened. At some point within the last month is the best he can do. Seven says this phenomenon isn't new to her. The Borg found a ship adrift with a similarly butchered corpse aboard, but didn't bother to find out why. With nothing else to be done, Janeway orders the corpse to be put back on its ship while we continue to the relay station. A couple of days later, we arrive at the station. Kim reports that it's more than 100,000 years old, so it's clearly built to last. It's also running on a quantum singularity, which is why it's throwing out those gravity wibblies. Chakotay seems a bit surprised by this, which is odd, as, if I remember my DS9, Romulan ships are powered in the same way. Maybe we hadn't discovered that before they got pulled to the Delta Quadrant. Regardless, we can't get any closer without being shaken apart, so this is the best we're going to do for retrieving that message. 
Seven and Janeway in Astrometrics manage to grab some of the data, and the fragments show it to be a letter to a crew member. After a three-year wait, it looks like they're finally getting some mail. Retrieving what they can, Janeway hands them to Neelix. His myriad jobs will now include postal service. Perhaps simply transmitting them to their recipients lacks a personal touch, though I'd question the logic of handing them over to the guy who runs a gossip TV show. There'll be more to deliver once we piece them together, and off Neelix goes. Janeway's called back inside Astrometrics by Seven. She thinks she's found something hidden behind the letters, specifically a block of text and something that could be maps. Despite her earlier advice to not get too excited, Janeway wonders if this might be a plan of some sort. And she's not the only one left with something to think about. Seven is entirely disinterested in returning to Earth, saying that it holds no emotional value for her, until Janeway suggests that she may have family there. Neelix is taking his mail carrier duties seriously, or as seriously as he can do while dressed like a court jester. He also seems to believe that mail duty involves expecting the recipient to read it to him, as he asks questions when Chakotay has handed a letter. He says it's from an old friend, specifically the one who recruited him for that terrorist organization we'd glossed over that he was in. He doesn't feel like sharing more and leaves after handing control of the bridge to Paris. Kim asks if there are any more letters as Neelix tries to leave, perhaps hoping there'll be one containing the character he's been missing for nearly four seasons now. Not yet, says Neelix, but there are more on the way. Looks like Tuvok has one of the first batch as well. Neelix is offended by the idea that Tuvok doesn't immediately stop everything to read it, not least of which because he knows it's got important news as he's already had a go at it himself. I'd call that a breach of security personally, but Voyager's chief of security doesn't seem that asked, and instead allows Neelix to start reading it to him. We learn that Tuvok's eldest son has gone through Ponfar, Vulcan Chaga season, and now has a daughter. Grandpa Tuvok reconsiders letting Neelix read the rest, taking the letter from him. As Neelix leaves, Tuvok goes back to the work he was doing, until the pull of the letter is too much for even a Vulcan heart, and he stops to read that instead. Janeway's had a letter of her own from her partner, Mark. As it doesn't immediately start with photos of her dog, Molly, and the puppies she's had, I can only assume he's a complete bastard. Janeway's face seems to concur, so I'm guessing he moved on at some point during the last three years she's been gone. As it's previously been implied that Janeway did the same with Chicote, that seems only fair. The bad news keeps coming, and Chicote has to share some with Balana. The Marquis they were part of, fighting against the Cardigans? Not any more. They're all gone, wiped out by the Cardigans and their new mates from the Gamma Quadrant. As a fair portion of Voyager's crew were former Marquis, this might be a bit of a problem. Bellana has a big old rant promising that someone will pay, but ultimately, there's bugger all they can do about it. And there's bugger all Kim can do about not getting a letter either. Neelix arrives in the mess hall for another round of deliveries, but Kim's not featured among them, leaving him unreasonably pissy at Paris. If he wanted someone to share his desire for letters from home, the former prisoner whose dad is an asshole was a terrible choice. A sad Janeway is interrupted by Seven at her door. Retrieving the data is becoming more difficult, but Seven thinks a shuttle could get closer without suffering ill effects from the gravity wibblies that prevent Voyager from doing the same. Janeway agrees, after saying Tuvok will accompany her, and Seven leaves her alone so she can be sad some more. She could be sad with company if she knew about Kim. He's still pining for a letter, and has gone to Astrometrics to see if there's anything new. He's shit out of luck, though, and instead receives a bit of mockery from Balana about his crush on Seven. In her defence, she stops when she sees how much the lack of contact from home is bothering him, and tries to offer comfort. Let's hope Seven can resolve the problem by getting the rest of the message. She and Tuvok are flying over to the relay now, and, on the way, Seven inquires if Janeway normally insists on sending two people in a shuttle. Tuvok responds that it's not only normal for Janeway, but in fact recommended Starfleet protocol. Unless you're Chakotay in Season 2, then you get to borrow one for a bit of alone time with no questions asked, and yes, I'm still bitter about that. Anyway, Seven asked because she wasn't sure if it was an indication that Janeway still doesn't trust her, and we welcome this chance to see Seven trying to find out where she fits, as well as navigating personal interactions. As an aside, Seven calls Tuvok Commander here after a couple of previous examples of calling him Lieutenant, despite his promotion. Good to see I wasn't the only one who spotted it. Bugger all of that, though, as after pooping some yellow at the relay, a few flashes happen that knock out navigation. That means they don't know where Voyager is and need a hand getting back to the ship. 
That's assuming they can get back at all. They've also lost communications, warp engines, and weapons. It's all a bit too coincidental for Tuvok, who says it might have something to do with the big, angular ship that's currently flying towards them. The shuttle gets pooped at and tries to leg it, but fails. As it's pulled towards the angular ship, a different poop hits the cockpit and knocks out Seven and Tuvok. If it's our friend Union John from the start of the episode, they have nothing to worry about. He only takes trophies from things with mandibles. Balana's decrypting more letters and calls Paris down to astrometrics. He's hesitant when he arrives, and even more so after finding out that it's from his dad, who's an admiral in Starfleet and also a complete asshole. We get a little discussion on his life back home essentially being a disaster, and him finding purpose and connections here on Voyager that he lacked before. His dismissive attitude causes Balana to tell him about her news, that nearly everybody she knew from before is now dead, and, after comforting her, he's more open to the idea of hearing from his father. Fair play to the writing here, this is the first time since Threshold that I've actually given a shit about Paris. Chakotay's reporting to Janeway, and we learn the message decryption is faster now because of what Seven and Tuvok did to the relay. If their lack of contact afterwards is concerning, we're doing a good job of hiding it. While he's there, he inquires about Janeway's letter. She responds that it was from the man she was engaged to, and I note the use of the past tense. After a suitable period of mourning, Mark moved on with his life and married a woman he works with. Even worse, he's rehomed all of the puppies, and told you he was a bastard. No time for sadness now, though, as Kim calls them from the bridge. We've received a distress call from the shuttle, but nobody's on it. it smells like bait to me. Aboard the angular ship, we discover the Herogen are a species of varied hobbies. As well as the face painting we saw earlier, it seems some prepare artistic bone displays, while yet others practice a form of alien shibari. Which is why a woozy Tuvok wakes to find himself strapped up, though I notice he doesn't react as though this is his first time experiencing it. Seven wakes as well, but neither are given a chance to escape before the arrival of Union John. He claims them as relics of the hunt, though also says they were shit at it. Daubing them with paint, he questions them about Voyager and orders an underling to prepare for a fight, overruling a suggestion that they wait for backup. Over on Voyager, Kim's detected the Hirogen ship and identifies it as such. How he'd know that when we've never met them before is beyond me, but let's ignore that for now. He also says Tuvok and Seven are on board, so we give them a call. Union John suggests that we should leave before his mates turn up, something Janeway will agree to as soon as Tuvok and Seven are returned. Union John doesn't care for those terms, so we go into mood lighting mode and get ready for some pooping. But despite his earlier comments, Union John is far less interested in the fight than in being the first Herogen to claim a Starfleet skull. His underling is still hesitant, saying we should focus on the battle, but is again overruled, and they get ready to start slicing up Tuvok. While they prepare, Voyager's working on trying to get the rest of the signal, whilst also seeing if they can teleport Tuvok and Seven back. We'd best hurry, as Union John's mates are getting close, and Paris comments on their massive weapons. Janeway's solution is to fight dirty. We've got a quantum singularity sitting there, so we might as well use it, and hopefully pull the other ships in. We'll have to escape it ourselves, of course, and get Tuvok and Seven back too, but those are mere details, so we poop some science at the relay. It's shaky-shaky time over on the Herogen ship. Tuvok takes the chance to borrow a knife and slash Union John's neck, but Herogen are built differently, as it only serves to cause annoyance. Tuvok is thrown across the room by Union John, who then turns his attention to stopping his ship from kabooming. His plan to make that happen is shooting Voyager, and he tells his mates to do the same. All of which causes Voyager's science wibbly to completely arse up the relay, which collapses into the singularity and exposes it. Union John's mates are pulled in and kaboom, with him in danger of going the same way. We're told teleporting Tuvok and Seven is possible, but very dangerous, so obviously we're going to do that. Pushing the engines hard enough that we can escape is equally dangerous, so let's do that too. Janeway rolls a nat 20, and we manage to achieve both. Then we scarper, while Union John joins his mates. Down in Astrometrics, Balana is telling Janeway that we just fucked up the whole network by kabooming this relay. There'll be no more letters from home any time soon. Speaking of which, we've recovered a handful more of them, but more importantly, got most of the encrypted Starfleet message that was hidden under them. It'll take time to decrypt, so we've got that to look forward to in a future episode. While we wait, Balana's taken over mail duty. Kim gets his letter, and Paris doesn't.
The rest of it wasn't retrieved, so Balana suggests Paris should work on the assumption that its contents were good. In Janeway's ready room, Tuvok warns us that we'll see the Hirogen again, and they'll be proper pissed about the relay network we just ruined, which seems fair enough to me. Tuvok leaves as Chakotay arrives. Over coffee, we remind the viewers that she's single now, and they go arm in arm to a party that Neelix has just organised as we fly away. The psychology of a crew away from home for so long, and how that interacts with family and friends who thought them lost, is something I've wanted to see us explore for a little while, so this episode is a welcome one. It also has some satisfying little diversions, such as Seven grappling with the opinions of others starting to matter to her, or Kim's fruitless search for some sort of personality. I presume the focus of the episode was meant to be Janeway's breakup news, but that point had already been made in Season 2 with Lord Stickass on the holodeck and that time where she and Chakotay totally banged, so there was no real impact from it here. The more interesting topic for me was Paris receiving contact from his father, It's been prodded at previously that much of what Paris turned into is because of the overbearing dickery of his dad, expectations placed on him as a child that shadowed him during his adulthood. I said previously how disappointed I was that season two had such a great opportunity to explore this, and instead chose to use it as cover for making him space James Bond. In my opinion, that pissed away the best chance to make Paris relatable instead of just a dick. So seeing it return again and drag with it the baggage he carries is another chance to do that justice. It's also interesting to see how differently Balana viewed the message. For all her bluster about not wanting contact from a father she never really knew, her urging Paris to give this a chance suggests she's aware of the damage done by her own paternal issues and doesn't want the same for Paris. Another point worth mentioning is that Paris immediately dropped his own self-pity when he saw Balana suffering, an act that goes some way towards his redemption in my eyes. Despite my previous assertions that I don't care much for romance plots, this might serve as a way of showing he's capable of looking beyond himself, and for that alone, we shall be watching how it plays out with increased interest. End of episode. Hello, it's Beth Dog again. So, I'm still in the brig. I'll be honest, part of that's my fault. I did try and have a little bit of an escape attempt. Long story short, I melted a bloke's face off. It were only an ensign though, so that's basically not even a real person. Just ask Harry Kim. I guess that's why they're going ahead with the teleporter thing next week. Still sounds pretty dangerous to me, but they said they've learned a lot about teleporter accidents from someone called Tuvix, so I'm sure it'll be fine. Woof.